is there shouldn't be, and not to call you out on that, no. there shouldn't be a, I think I did it. Because it's, it's I did it, or I did not. Because if it balanced, it, it's balanced, and you are correct. Okay? If your numbers don't align, then you didn't balance it, and you're wrong. Okay? So it's actually one of the things that's nice about balancing is you should, under most circumstances, know you are 100% right or you are 100% wrong. Okay? There isn't really a gray area in between. There are a few cases where those gray areas can pop up, but they're fairly rare. Okay? So what I wanted to go through and do is look at the process behind how I would recommend you do it. So if you're struggling to deal with balancing, this is how I would do it. One of the things that can become challenging with balancing is you will watch the person next to you and they don't write anything down except the answer. And you're like, what the? How did you do that? They internalized a lot of it because they've had more practice than you, either with balancing itself or they're better with those numbers and that number logic. Okay? <coughs> don't let that detract from your abilities. You just have to get used to it. You have to get that practice. That means more practice for you. Okay, so let's go through and take a look at this with the information we got up there. We had the equation. I wrote the iron, the chloride, and the oxygen, and then I wrote all the numbers down next to each of them, representing the numbers on each side. Okay, a lot of people did that. I would argue that's wrong. Okay, nothing about what's written there is wrong, but it's the process by which you're doing it that I think becomes problematic. Okay. Start with your first element, balance it. Move to the next element, balance it. Move to the next element, balance it. By writing this three, okay, if I balance the iron, that three changes. I'm now repeating work. Does that make sense? Is that a yes or a no? Some people said no, so let's work through it. So I'm going to start with the iron. Okay, how many irons on the left? Irons on the right? Sorry. Ah! <coughs> Sorry. Now irons on the right. One, right? Everybody see that? Okay. I need to have two irons to balance it. So I'm going to put a two in front. That now applies to everything after it. Up to a mathematical operator, there's my mathematical operator. Okay. So that means I would now have two irons. Yes? The next part is what does that 2 do to everything else, which would be moving into the chlorine. If we look at the left, I haven't done anything to the left, so it's still two chlorines. But let's look to the right. Is it three chlorines? No, it's changed. If I went through to count out that 3 and you're like, it's not that much time, that is time that you've now wasted to write a 3 because it's not 3. Okay? It's already changed after doing the very first step. That's a waste in time. Does that make sense now? Okay, so I'm going to erase that because that shouldn't be there. The oxygen shouldn't be there either. So now comes the part on the right-hand side. How do we figure out how many chlorines are there? Okay, well, there's this three that applies forward to what's directly in front of it. Okay, that's the arrow I've been referencing. So there's three chlorines. This two applies backwards to everything after it up to that mathematical operator. So we get arrows going up the yin-yang. That can become confusing. So what we can do is break that down a little bit to represent what's happening. When I write FeCl3, what does that mean? That means I have one iron and three chlorines. Yeah? If I have two FeCl3, there are my two. How many chlorines are in those two things? Six. Six. Okay. That manipulation is the same thing that we did with the arrows and the pushing and the fun stuff up at the top. Okay. But recognizing how those numbers relate and interconnect comes from drawing it all the way out. If you're having a hard time showing those connections, draw it all out. Okay. Don't draw it all out on the exam. Draw it all out now so you understand where those connections are so that when you get to the exam, you can do it all in your head. Okay? So I have six chlorines on the right. How many chlorines on the left? Two. How many chlorines do I need? So what do I got to do? 
I need a three there. That becomes six. Shouldn't have picked red. Right? Right. Oxygen's on the left. Three. Oxygen's on the right. Two. Do those balance? No. So how can I fix that? Okay. I want to find a multiple between three and two. How many multiples are there of three and two? What's the largest number you can think of? Someone laughed, so they understood the reference there. The largest number you can think of is infinite, which means how many multiples are there of three and two? Infinite. Okay. We want to start with the smallest multiple of two. Why start with the smallest multiple of two? Because that way, if it's wrong, what do I do? I move up one more. Okay. If I start with an arbitrary random middle one and it's wrong, now what do I do? I go back or I go up. Too many different options. Limit your options as you move through. Okay? So what is the lowest common multiple between 3 and 2? 6. So how can I make that 3 into a 6? Times it by 2. Where do I place that 2? In front, so that now applies backwards, yeah? Okay. What happened to the oxygen? Or the, uh, the other oxygen, the O2 on the right. It needs to be 6, right? What is it right now? What do I need to do? Put it by a 3. That becomes 6. Right? Now what do I do? I wouldn't, I know where you're, why you're saying fix the iron, and I would argue it's not fix the iron, it's start over. Okay? It's now reset everything so we can clean this up. This is why it's nice to have, you know, whiteboard space. And now go through and evaluate. How many irons? Four. How many irons? Two. That's not balanced. How do I fix it? This needs to become 4. How do I make a 2 a 4? Times it by 2. Yeah? Oh, but that screwed up my chlorine. I, that's why we're checking it. So we can move to the chlorine now. How many chlorines on the left? 6. It's okay. On the right? 12. Those aren't the same. How do we make them the same? What's the lowest common multiple between 6 and 12? 12. How do I make this be 12 chlorines? Okay. Oxygen's on the left. Yes, I agree. The oxygen's on the right? 6. So the oxygen was balanced. I changed a number, which means we go back and we start it again. How many irons on the left? Four. Irons on the right. Four. Chlorine's on the left. Five. Chlorine's on the right. Five. Oxygen's on the right. Six. And left? Six. Does it balance? Yeah. yeah. What should we do? We should check it again. All right? Particularly when it's coming to homework. And it is that iterative process of constantly cycling through the entire question and looping back that you should be getting used to. Some people will internalize that. Some people won't. All right, don't stress about it. You've got time to write it all out. We good? Good. Let's make it more difficult. What you now have to be able to do is to look at a chemical equation and be able to balance it. Not only that, but you have to be able to look at a chemical equation and say that is a combustion reaction. That is a double replacement. That is a single replacement. Right? So you need to be able to categorize those different types of reactions. Why? Because they have different things associated with them that can become important. Of particular relevance, 
particularly for you guys, would be the last four. Why are the last four special? This is fun. They are special for an eraser. What are you expected to be able to do? You are expected to be able to predict those products. You can't predict those products if you don't know what chemical reaction it is. Right? So you have to be able to look at a chemical reaction and relatively quickly assign which type of reaction it is so that you can predict the products or decide I don't need to predict that. Does that make sense? So we get different rule sets that follow each of those. Right? So what we're seeing here is the general format for everything. Right? It covers them fairly well. Single replacements, there are some kind of extra ones. Okay? We can potentially do this format. Oh, ah, you monkey. You can get this kind of system happening. What changed? Which one's being replaced? In the standard format or the easy format, if you want to call it that, what's being exchanged? The blue one, right? The cation. Which species are typically cations? Metals. Metals are typically cations. So in our single replacement, we will talk about single replacement reactions with the metals being replaced. Non-metals can also be replaced in a single replacement type reaction. Okay? And that's what I'm showing underneath. Okay? It gets a little bit different, potentially a little bit more complicated, okay? but it's still ultimately doing the same thing. Okay? So that's why those color codes are in there. Those color codes do not mean a single atom. They mean a single unit. It could mean an atom. It could also mean a complex ion. Okay? And our complex ions are now a unit that could potentially exchange in both cases. Okay? Should we look at some examples? Sure. So combination reactions. First and foremost, do you have to predict the products of combination reactions? No, you do not. The combination you do not have to predict products for. In the homework, can you be expected to predict products? Let's try it this way. Let's look at the question at the bottom there. Magnesium metal reacts with oxygen, with oxygen gas to produce magnesium. What did you just do? You just predicted the product. Are you expected to do that? No. How were you able to do that? Let's write it out. What does magnesium metal look like? Mg. It's a metal, so solid. Reacts with plus oxygen gas. Oh, gee, does anybody want to step up and say that's not true? It should be O2. Why is it not just O? Oxygen is a diatomic. It needs to say oxygen atom. It doesn't say oxygen atom. It's O2. To produce. And we just smashed them together, right? So we smashed Mg with oxygen. You said magnesium oxide. We put them together. Does that look like I just put them together? No, why not? It doesn't have a two, right? So now I've smashed them together, right? I still didn't smash them together? Okay. Do you know the phase? You don't know what the phase is, so you can't predict the phase. So that's not why I'm going to complain about this. Should you be able to predict this product? You have the ability to, yes. Okay. What does that ability hinge on? Yeah. 
Easy answer. What were your reactants? Magnesium and oxygen. Are you responsible for knowing that magnesium is Mg and oxygen is O? And that if you put them together, you would have some combination of Mg and O? Yes. Okay, cool. That's good. Good. Because you are responsible for that. Okay. What else might you need to be responsible for? What do we specify in those lower right-hand corners? The number of each element. Are you expected to be able to figure out the number of the elements in that formula? Yes. Why? No. And for those of you being like, because it's explicitly stated, that formula, for those of you writing your notes, wrong. What's that? What do you mean because of the charge? When we put together a compound, the overall charge has to be zero. Are you responsible for knowing the charge on magnesium? We were like, I don't remember. Yep, unit one. You are required to know that magnesium is a plus two because it's in the second column of the periodic table. You are required to know that oxygen in an ionic compound, what's an ionic compound? A metal and a non-metal, magnesium being a metal, oxygen being a non-metal, ionic. Oxygen has what charge? A minus two. When I put those two pieces together, it has to overall equal a zero charge. How many oxygens need to go into my formula? One. Okay. For those of you keeping track, you might be like, that sounds an awful lot like nomenclature. If you're doing nomenclature by balancing charges, as I asked you to do, it is. If you're doing nomenclature by crossover rules, you're like, this means nothing to nomenclature. That's why I didn't tell you that. This is why I told you, you need to be looking at how those charges balance out when trying to predict things. Because balancing the charges is how you predict your product, not just names. It stacks. Yay. Everybody loves stacking blocks. So you are required to know that that is MGO. Now what becomes your question or problem with that? Where did the other oxygen go? Started with O2. We've now predicted the proper product. Have we balanced the equation yet? What do we have to do? Balance the equation. How many magnesiums on the left? On the left? On either side for that matter. It would be one and one. How many oxygens on the left? Oxygens on the right? One. Those don't balance. What do we need to do? Now our oxygens balance. What do we do? We start over. How many magnesiums on the left? Magnesiums on the right? Two. Does that balance? What do you do? Two. Noticing the repeating patterns. Oxygens on the left. Two and two, are we balanced now? Yes, now we have a proper balanced equation. Okay. To do this, we had to be able to know that we formed magnesium oxide. That is within your wheelhouse for this particular example. Okay. When it comes to combination, I do not expect you to be able to predict them. You can do it in certain circumstances. Okay. Usually what it requires is that you have some more information, kind of like three potential classes of combination reactions. Follow the rule sets of those. The reaction of a metal with oxygen, ta-da, magnesium and oxygen, there it is. Okay. The reaction of a non-metal with oxygen, should we try that one? That enthusiasm was exactly what I was expecting. I hate Mike, I know. Let's just fix that problem altogether. <laughs> Bromine gas with oxygen. What do we produce? You should be able to give me a really, really solid guess. Bromine and oxygen. Those people being like, really? Yeah. 
What's the part that you can't tell me? How much bromine and oxygen? With the first example, were you able to predict it? Shia was. Why was she able to pull that one off? She knew the charge on the metals because you were required to memorize those. Do you know the charge on bromine? Minus one. Awesome statement. That's fantastic. Half of the other half class said no. When is it minus one? When is it minus one? And for people, it's one away from the noble gases. That's not actually when it's minus one. When is it minus one? Say it again. No. When it's in an ionic compound, it is a minus one. Is that an ionic compound? Nope. Do you know its charge? You don't, which means how do you know how much bromine needs to go into that compound? You don't. Can you predict it? Nope. So instead of telling you that you can do some combinations but not others, I just said, don't predict any. Ta-da! See, I am a nice guy. Maybe that one was the sarcasm, right? All right? So don't stress about predicting your combination reactions. There are some examples that you are able to predict. Those tend to be the ones that get asked in the textbook, okay? or they give you some extra rules to look at in the, in the text. Read the text when you try and answer those questions. Okay? Decomposition reactions. I also do not expect you to be able to predict, but I do expect you to be able to balance okay? and identify. So what about that question tells you you did a decomposition? Okay. So we're hearing separate into two elements. So what, where do you see separates into two elements? Okay, I'm hearing A and B. Stop being jerks. That one. What about that statement tells you you're doing a decomposition? What's that? And? Okay, I like that. Looking for a key off that we have an and. Because if we went back and looked at that equation, right, there's an and. There's that plus. Let's backtrack. Isn't there an and there too? Reaction of a metal and oxygen and oxygen and nonmetal. The presence of the and shows up in all of them. So I like that you've keyed off on that and. That is good. But we need a little bit more than just that and. Where does that and show up? Okay, I heard an after and I heard a produces. It shows up after the production, meaning that and is in reference to the products. I don't see an and before the produces, which means more than likely I am starting with one thing. How could I ensure that that was correct? Mercury is what symbol? Close. HG? Oh, no, HGS. Yes. Oxide. Oh. Is O. Produces. HG plus O2. Right? How do I know that's a decomposition? When I actually write out the pieces, I can see that that's a decomposition. I don't have to do the linguistics of the English language. I can actually convert that out into an expression. In that expression, it matches the setup. Does that make sense? Would we need the, the delta sign? Do you need to show the delta sign? I won't ask you to show that, um, but it is something that you typically see with our decompositions is that delta. Usually to start a decomposition, you need heat. Okay, so you could see that delta over it. It's not the only time you use temperature, no. Okay, but it is oftentimes seen with decompositions. Is that equation a correct equation? No, what's wrong with it? What's not balanced? OK, 
Okay? The answer I really want on that is everything. Okay? And I'm hearing people, well, the auctions aren't balanced. Well, before we start looking at the auctions, you need to make sure that the formula you wrote here was correct. Okay? So before you start balancing the equation, make sure you wrote the proper formula for mercury 2 oxide. How do I figure that out? Charges. I need the charges. Conveniently, because this is a binary ionic compound, I see the Roman numeral. That Roman numeral references the charge on mercury. The mercury is a plus 2. Because this is an ionic compound, I also know the charge on the oxygen because I memorized that for ionic compounds. Minus 2. Is that formula correct? Yes. Since my formula is correct, I can now go through and evaluate everything else. Mercury metal is Hg. Why was this O2? It's diatomic. Okay. Now I can attempt to balance the equation. Is the equation balanced? Nope. What can I do? And now I've got it balanced. Some of the coefficients? Five. All right. Kind of, sort of? You guys seem super energized. Is it my fault? Probably. Okay. We'll skip our decompositions. We'll move into our double replacements. We're going to skip the single replacement for a moment. Okay. In our double replacement reaction, we start with ionic compounds again. We start with two ionic compounds, and we end with two ionic compounds. These ones become trickier because you are required to predict what your products are. So we've got two equations here, or two reactions started for you. I want you to write them down. Write out the full reaction. Do as much as you can as far as the nomenclature goes. Do as much as you can as far as predicting products go. If you've got questions, raise your hand. I will come to you and we can talk about it. And I'll give you a little more time to do this. So if we look at it, barium chloride, uh, I've underlined the D and put up a little white flag. That little white flag is a tip-off that we're looking at a binary ionic compound, which means there's only two elements present. All right. If we continue to read through, we get potassium chromate. That T is a giant red flag that you're looking at a ternary ionic compound. What I got a lot of people doing is saying K and then CR and then not knowing where to go. K and CR should immediately, and that's good, you're putting information down. You do acknowledge that those things are there. But K and CR should be a problem because that's not ionic. That's two metals bonded to each other. That doesn't work for the double replacement. Okay? It is a double replacement reaction, which means your interpretation of chromate being CR was wrong. Okay? Some people are like, but I wasn't told to memorize that. I'd be like, I know, I didn't tell you to memorize that. So other people have pulled out their notes where they found that chromate is CrO4 with a minus 2 charge. So as far as putting this whole thing together goes, I'm going to move the potassium chromate up top here for a second because I need that space to write the whole kit and caboodle. So we'll start with this. Barium chloride. Barium is a Ba. Chloride is... CL, it's aqueous. I actually did a half decent CL. Reacts with a plus, I saw that look, come on. Plus aqueous potassium chromate, K, CrO4, aqueous. I heard someone say aqueous. You can make fun of me as much as you want, I don't care. I don't care how you pronounce that either. Uh, we're going to do the double replacement, which means our metals will exchange with each other. So I'm going to leave the non-metals in their place. And I'm going to get potassium chloride. And I'm going to get barium chromate. Chromate? Chromate. The exact order of those last two does not matter which one comes first. So don't stress about that. All we're doing is the exchange. Okay? Um... Should we start balancing the equation? No. Why should we not balance the equation? We have to ensure that each of our formulas was correct. So we can go back to each formula. Barium has a plus 2 from the periodic table. Chloride has a 
minus one also from the periodic table, which means I need two chlorides to balance that barium. We can move to the next one, potassium chromate. Potassium has a plus one. Chromate has a minus two. Again, I wouldn't expect you to memorize that. That's why we talked about it. I was actually trying to get you to ask me that question. It didn't really work very well, but not balanced. So what do I need? Two potassiums. Charge on potassium. Plus one, charge on chloride. Minus one, that formula is correct. Charge on barium. Plus two, chromate. Minus two, that formula is correct. Now that all my formulas are correct, now I can attempt to balance the whole equation. I've done this a few times. All we need is that two in front of the potassium chloride and everything should balance out. Yeah? Yeah, I just don't have a lot of space to write stuff. Okay, I'm gonna hold on that phase thought for a moment and we'll go ahead and take a look at the bottom one, sodium chloride, NaCl, aqueous, reacts with, Lithium nitrate, LiNO3, aqueous, produces. I'm going to do my exchange. Should I do the following, the exact same powder as the orange one, or switch it up? Okay, I heard to switch it up, so we'll do that. I'm going to exchange the non-metals. Okay, the non-metals become a little bit tricky, and I should have addressed, the, well, I didn't need to address it with the last one. The non-metals I'm exchanging are the Cl for what? For the NO3. The NO3 is a complex ion. It's a new unit. It's going as a whole piece. So that means I end with NaNO3 plus lithium with the chloride. Questions about anything that's up there? Yes? We haven't addressed phase changes, so we'll touch on that in just a second. Questions about those? Bottom one came out balanced. That kind of fluidity with predicting and balancing and all of that is what you should ideally be picking up here quickly. Okay? So the last part of this is you are also expected to be able to predict phases. Okay? So all you've really got to do is to go through and recognize that there's potassium there, so that's chlora uh, aqueous. There's a sodium there, so that's aqueous. There's a lithium there, that's aqueous. And because I don't have any of those, that must be solid. Some people are laughing, that's good. You have to know some rules, right? There's not just something you know. There are pieces of information that are missing that you would have to know to be able to apply to these equations, right? to these phases, okay, which might be what that hand was. Okay. So what are we looking at? Okay. To figure those out, we have to be looking for some more information. That more information is actually experimentally driven. So what we have done is we've run thousands of reactions and we've noticed certain trends. Those certain trends get written into solubility rules. I don't necessarily like how your textbook has formatted these solubility rules, okay? But it's what we've got. It's what I can trust that everybody has access to, okay? So let's work through this, okay? So let's take a look at predicting our phases. We were given the reactant phases, but let's go ahead and prove that. Barium chloride, aqueous. So in reading my solubility rules, what I need to do is find either barium or chloride in my rules. So, scan through the rules. Do you see either barium or chloride? Feel free to say no, you don't see them. That's okay. Does it help if I underline them? I think I got them all. There, you're right, see? Nobody's perfect. So there are all the rules where our elements show up. So let's start from the bottom. Okay, rule 10. 
talking about hydroxide ion. Is the barium with hydroxide ion in our particular case? No. What does that mean? That rule isn't useful. Rule nine, the barium's with sulfide. Also not useful. Rule five, barium's with sulfate. Not useful. Rule four, chloride. There it is. Okay. In that, it says there are exceptions, and those exceptions are insoluble. Well, what does that mean when I see chloride then? In a, a subtle dig to lab, first thing we would have to do is look at the heading. And that heading says that anything under that, rules one through five, these things are soluble in water, which means they dissolve. So they would become a solution. What is the phase name for a solution in water? Aqueous, which is way too many letters and too many vowels. So we can write AQ. Did I spell it wrong? Sorry, somebody said something. Okay, so if we look at chloride, a halide ion, it should be aqueous. Whenever I see chloride, it should be an aqueous compound, except when it's bonded to silver, mercury, and lead. Is barium silver, mercury, or lead? No would be the answer to that, right? So those are different sounds that came out of my mouth. Are we just that energetic? Okay. Frustrated and confused. Frustrated and confused. Okay, well, I'm trying to step it slowly. So what does that mean the phase should be? Aqueous. What did we say it was? Now someone was going, it was aqueous. Now it's aqueous. I heard that. Yes, it's aqueous. Okay? But those were given to us. So we should hopefully trust that what we were given was true. So let's not check those. Let's check the different ones. Barium chromate. Conveniently, I just erased all the times barium showed up. Okay? But look through for barium and look through for chromate. Right? Looking at those rules, we've got rule 5, 7, 9 and 10. Which of those rules should we be looking at? Do we need to be looking at all of them? Seven. 5, 9, and 10 don't reference chromate. So I don't need to be looking at those ones. Only one of them do I need to look at. It's the chromate one. What does that rule say? It says see rule 1. No, actually it says look at the heading. It is insoluble in water. If it does not dissolve in water, what phase? We're now looking at a solid. Don't confuse soluble with S. Right? Those are two different things. Soluble is AQ. Insoluble is solid for S. Okay? So rule 7 says if we see chromate, it's insoluble. Are there exceptions? Yes, it says to look at rule one. So let's look at rule one. Does rule one say anything about barium? No, which means it's not an exception, it's solid. There it is. Ta-da. Make sense? All right, a couple things I'll point out. That's a lot of rules. It's not even close to half of them. All right, it's probably not even a quarter of the possible solubility rules. These are the solubility rules you are expected to work with in this class. Okay? I do not expect you to memorize these. That's why it says up at the top, I will give you a condensed solubility chart. Okay? So you don't have to stress about memorizing these. You do have to stress about using it. If you want to know what that solubility chart looks like, look at the practice exam at the very front where it says solubility chart and it gives you the rules. Think about your solubility rules in that context and learn how to use that information. Does that make sense? Couldn't have been important. So, next thought.
Does it make sense to say both of these had a chemical reaction? Yes. Yes. What are the symbols that you had a chemical reaction? One, two, three. Three things for a chemical reaction. You're like, what? Yeah, there were, there were three things. Your book said four. Remember, I said two of them were the same. What were the three things that said you had a chemical reaction? Metal with an oxygen is not a chemical or sign of a chemical reaction. Metals reacting with oxygen to produce a metal oxide is a type of combination reaction. I'm not saying what type of reaction this is because these are all double replacements. What I'm asking is how do you know a chemical reaction has happened? Change in state. <coughs> color change. Okay? And I'm going to say permanent color. So permanent color change and change in energy. Okay, so there's three things. When you look at this equation, can you see a change in energy? No, a change in energy would be a change in temperature. When you look at an equation, do you see a change in temperature? No, what do you need? Freaking thermometer. There's no thermometer, so you can't see a change in energy. Okay, so that's not a useful one for us. Permanent color change. Do you see any colors in those sentences? No. no. So color change, not useful. What's the first one? Change in state. For that first equation, what did we start as phase states? Aqueous, 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 but? Which means? Chemical reaction happened. What happened in the next one? Aqueous, 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 aqueous. No change in phase. If there is no change in phase, not a chemical reaction. What about permanent color and energy? So deciding on the permanent color and the change in state okay, could be possibilities that would be outside the scope of your ability to do without actually testing it. So what you're looking at is saying that we don't have the ability to evaluate two and three. The only rule we've got is rule one, change in state. We don't have the change in state, which means no reaction. So you went through that process of shuffling the cations and anions to get to your products, right? And really what I'm now saying after all of that Is that mildly frustrating? No? It is, yeah. Okay. If you knew your solubility rules backwards and forwards, you could do that swap in your head to predict no reaction. If you don't know your solubility rules, what should you do? Write it all out. Is that frustrating? Yeah. Are you going to be right? Yeah, are you frustrated that you're right? Yeah, probably not, right? Hopefully. All right. So write that work out. That will help ensure that you get the correct answer and you can get these no reaction type things popping up. Okay. Neutralization reactions are a special case of double replacements. Okay. What makes them special is they are very specifically referring to acids reacting with bases. Right. We're going to run them in a very particular fashion where we will produce HOH, also known as water. No, not ha, it would be ho. And BA. What is BA? <laughs> Touche. It would be an ionic compound, also known as just a salt. So when we're going through and running neutralization reactions, we'll end with water and a salt. We'll modify that definition later in the semester, but right now that works for us. So if we were to go through and say predict the complete neutralization of sulfuric acid with potassium hydroxide, right away you know one of the products. What is that product? 
water. Okay? To figure out the other one, you'd have to go through, predict your reaction to show all the exchanges, just like you did for the double replacement, and everything would work out beautifully and wonderful because you're fantastic at listing and following directions. Yeah? That was a mild field trip. We okay? Should we break the bank? Oh, oh. I thought the computer froze up. Last reaction type, combustions. You're taking an organic compound, carbon and hydrogen. You're reacting it with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. That is it. Okay? So if I were to write out a general form, carbon and hydrogen compound, how many carbons? It doesn't matter. It can be any amount of carbons. So what could I write in this general format to ensure that I knew it was any number of carbons? X. Okay. With a certain amount of hydrogens. Y. Reacts with oxygen gas, O2 gas, to produce <coughs> carbon dioxide and H2O. That's it. So if you see carbon and oxygen producing CO2 and water, it's a combustion reaction. Okay. There are more advanced applications or examples of combustion reactions. You do not need to stress about those for the moment. Okay. We might very well look at a balancing one that I don't want to do right now, but I will suggest that you go through and try that on your own. If I picked the proper combustion reaction, it will suck. Okay? So if I didn't pick the proper combustion reaction, it'll be really easy to balance. But I think I picked one that will be a challenge. Okay? So give it a shot on your own outside of class. We'll talk about it um, maybe in two weeks. Okay? So more predictions. Okay? And I would love to stop and let you look at these ones, but again, I want to get through some of the content. Practice can happen later, closer to the exam, instead of getting more content in. Okay, make sense? Okay. Not where I thought I was going. Yeah, we'll do it. So, remember our prefixes? We had that jump around. We had our kilo, centi, all that fun stuff. We said we could do those. One of the things that's going to get us to is these relationships, these equalities. There are a thousand meters in one kilometer. That would be an English statement. I can turn that into a math statement. One kilometer equals one km. Why can I do that? I'm simplifying it. I'm lazy. I don't want to write out kilometers, so I just write km. And as long as everybody knows that's what I mean, it's good. Okay? Equals 1,000 meters. That in and of itself isn't particularly useful for us. But what if I want to know how many meters are in 2.34 kilometers? For those of you doing that math in your head, there's not necessarily any problems with that yet okay and that's the big issue what we are trying to do is figure out how you're doing that conversion so you said 2340 right so what did you do Just move the decimal. okay 2340 okay so we got an argument you just moved a decimal so if you just move a decimal can i say there's an equality there is that an equal expression? That's not an equals. That's saying I started with one number and I ended with another number. Do you have a process for that? You're just moving a decimal. What if it's not a power of 10? You, okay, so there we go. I like that. Way to work with me with really vague instructions. So you're saying you just multiplied it. You multiplied it by 1,000, yeah? KM. What did you do to the KM when you multiplied by 1,000? It became metered. How did it do that? You took the 
Yeah. Does this work show any of that? Okay. We're hearing a yes, it does. Where do you see K canceling? K stands for a thousand? In this context, kilometer is one thousand. In the context of one kilometer equaling one thousand meters, now I agree with you. Now that work is explicitly shown. Was it shown? No. So what people will go through and do is be all you do is multiply by a thousand. And I say convert moles, and you're like, what's that? The exact same process is what it is, okay, if you understand that process. That process wasn't multiplying by a thousand. It was recognizing the equality that we've addressed up here. But those don't look like the same thing, do they? One's an equal straight across and one's a fraction, right? Okay, you want to know another fun one? You didn't actually multiply by a thousand. What did you multiply by? One. When was the last time one times two point three four equaled two thousand anything? Certainly wasn't with a paycheck, right? Take a look at this expression. Can I get this one kilometer onto that side of the equation? Can I get this two onto that side of the equation? How? Divide by two. Can I get this one kilometer onto that side of the equation? Yes, what do I do? Divide by a thousand? To get the kilometer to the right hand side, divide by one kilometer. So let's look at what that says. We take one kilometer divided by one kilometer equals 1,000 meters over one kilometer. What is the same thing divided by itself? Math is stupid. Okay. For those people, I just multiplied by a thousand. You didn't. All of that work went into your multiplying by a thousand. Why were you able to get away with just multiplying by a thousand? How many times have you had to do that calculation? A lot. A lot. So what did you do? You internalized all of that work so that all you have to say is multiply by a thousand. What if we change to a different system that you don't understand because you've not used it? You wouldn't be able to do it unless you understand the dimensional analysis and where those values are coming from. Okay? This particular unit is a huge struggle and fight when we talk about these calculations. Because everybody will be like, but all I did was divide by 1,000. I multiplied by 1,000. It's not wrong. You're getting the right number, and I will absolutely grant you that every single time with this. But the instant I change it to a conversion that you have no concept about, you get it wrong, and then you blame me. It's not my fault. It's because you were cheating and didn't understand your initial process. If you don't understand the process, you can't apply it to anything. Okay? So when you're going through and doing the conversions in this unit, particularly chapter two, the work that we're making you do, the point of those questions is not to get the answer. The point of those questions is to write down a process where you can see all of your conversions come apart. And you can see that kilometers cancels out and that you're left with meters. That is going to be the critical aspect behind it. For those people that have cheats, that is fine for this unit. And the next unit, you will utterly bomb it because you won't have the process to be able to control it. Focus on that process of establishing it out.
To give you an idea on what that process is, we'll skip the notations for the moment. Your textbook does a really good job of this. Okay? It's called dimensional analysis, unit factor. There's tons of stupid names with it. Step one, make sure you know where you're going. Every time you solve a calculation, write an equals and a unit for what you want for the final answer. Step two, write down what you have. And then decide some unit factor that you need to do a conversion with. Okay? And you have to step through that process each and every single time. Right now, it is not because I think you can't convert feet into inches. Because okay? I'm pretty sure you can. Okay? I'm making you do those calculations now so that you trust the method. So that when we move to something that you don't know, skittle farts and snorlaxes, you can still solve it. Okay? So focus on the process in chapter 2 with those calculations. Okay? With that, I've got